The Gulag Archipelago, Volume 2, Section 1, Continued. Cassette 6, Side 1. I knew one lad, his name I believe was Machushin, he was an artist in the little camp at the Kaluga Gates, who had been sentenced under 58-1B very early on, even before the end of 1941, for having been taken prisoner when it had not yet been decided how this was to be treated or what term to give. They gave Matushin just three years, an unbelievable happening. At the end of his term he was, of course, not freed, but was told to await the special decree. But then came the amnesty. Matushin began to ask, there was no way he could demand, for release. For almost five months, until December 1945, the frightened officials of the classification and record section turned him down. Finally, he was released to go back home to Kursk province. There was a rumour, and it's quite impossible to believe in any other outcome, that soon afterward he was raked in and given something up to a whole tenor. It was impermissible to allow him to take advantage of the absent-mindedness of the first court. All those who had burglarised apartments, stolen the clothes of passers-by, raped girls, corrupted minors, given consumers short weight, played the hoodlum, disfigured the defenceless, been wantonly destructive in forests and waterways, committed bigamy, practised blackmail or extortion, taken bribes, swindled, slandered, written false denunciations, but those particular people didn't actually even serve time at all, that's for the future, peddled narcotics, pimped or forced women into prostitution, whose carelessness or ignorance had resulted in the loss of life, all went scot-free. And I have merely listed here the articles of the code covered by the amnesty. This is not a mere flourish of eloquence. And then they want morality from the people. Half their terms were eliminated for embezzlers, forgers of documents and ration cards, speculators and thieves of state property. Stalin still was touchy about the pockets of the state. But there was nothing so repugnant to the former front-line soldiers and POWs as the universal blanket pardon of deserters in wartime. Every man who, out of cowardice, ran away from his unit, left the front, did not show up at the conscription point, hid for many years in a pit in the vegetable garden of his mother's home, in cellars, behind the stove, always at the mother's, deserters as a rule did not trust their wives, who for years had not pronounced one word aloud, who had turned into hunched-up hairy beasts. All of them, as long as they had been caught or had turned themselves in by the day of the amnesty, were proclaimed now unsullied, unjudged, equal Soviet citizens. And that is when the perspicacity of the old proverb was justified, flight is not beautiful, but it is healthy. And those who trembled not, who did not play the card, who for their motherland took the enemy's blow and then paid for it with captivity, there could be no forgiveness for them. That's how the supreme commander-in-chief saw it. Was it that something in the deserters struck a chord in Stalin? Did he remember his own aversion to serving as a rank-and-file soldier, his own pitiful service as a recruit in the winter of 1917? Or did he simply conclude that cowards represented no danger to his rule and that only the bold were dangerous? After all, it might seem that it was not at all reasonable to amnesty deserters, even from Stalin's point of view. He himself had shown his people the surest and simplest way to save one's skin in any future war. And very likely there was also an historical justice here. An old debt was paid to deserting from the front, without which our whole history would have gone quite differently. In another book, I have told the story of Dr. Zhubov and his wife. An old woman in their house hid a wandering deserter, who later on turned them in for it. For this, the Zhubov's husband and wife got sentences of a tenor each under Article 58. The court determined that their guilt lay not so much in hiding a deserter as in the absence of any self-serving motive for this concealment. 
he was not a relative of theirs, which meant that it amounted to anti-Soviet intent. Under the Stalinist amnesty, the deserter himself was liberated without having served even three years, and he had already forgotten about that little episode of his life. But things went differently with the Zubovs. They each served out a full ten years in camp, four in special camps, and another four years without any sentence in exile. They were released only because exile in general was done away with, nor were their convictions annulled either when they were released, not even after sixteen years, nor even nineteen years after the events. And because of them, they could not return to their home near Moscow and were prevented from quietly living out their lives. In 1958, the chief military prosecutor replied to them, Your guilt was proven, and there are no bases for reconsidering the case. Only in 1962, after 20 years, was their case under Section 5810, anti-Soviet intent, and 5811, an organization of husband and wife, quashed. Under Article 193.17.7g, aiding a deserter, it was determined that their sentence was five years and, after twenty years, the Stalinist amnesty was applied. And that's precisely the way in which the two old people whose lives had been smashed were notified in 1962. As of July the 7th, 1945, you are considered released and your conviction annulled. Now that's what the rancorous, vengeful, unreasonable law fears, and what it does not fear. After the amnesty, they began to smear and smear with the paintbrushes of the cultural and educational sections, and the internal archways and walls of the camps were decorated with mocking slogans. For the broadest amnesty, we shall respond to our dear party and government with doubled productivity. The ones amnestied were the habitual criminals and non-political offenders, and the ones to respond with doubled work productivity were the politicals. When in history is our government shone with a sense of humor? With our fascist arrival, daily releases began immediately in Novi Jerusalem. Just the day before, you had seen women in the camp compound looking disgraceful, dressed in tatters, using profanity, and lo, they had suddenly been transformed, gotten washed, smoothed down their hair, and put on dresses with polka dots and stripes, which they'd got hold of heaven knows where, and with jackets over their arms they went modestly to the station. Seeing them on the train, would you ever guess that they knew how to swear like troopers? And there, leaving the gates, were thieves and half-breeds, who imitate the real thieves, they didn't drop their impudent bearing even there. They clowned and minced and waved to those left behind and shouted, and their friends shouted back to them from the windows. The guards didn't interfere. The thieves are permitted everything. One thief, not without imagination, stood his suitcase on end, climbed up on top of it lightly, and cocking his cap and tossing back the flaps of his jacket, copped off at a transit prison somewhere or one at cards, played a farewell serenade to the camp on his mandolin, singing some sort of thieves' twaddle, horse laughs. Those released still had a long walk on the path circling the camp and on through the field, and the folds of the barbed wire did not shut off from us the open view. That night those thieves would be strolling on the boulevards of Moscow, and perhaps even in their first week they would make their jump, clean out an apartment, They'd take the clothes off your wife or sister or daughter on the night streets. And as for you fascists, and Matronina was also a fascist, double your work productivity. Because of the amnesty, there was a shortage of manpower everywhere, and there were rearrangements. For a short time, I was switched from the clay pit to a plant section. There I could take a look at Matronina's mechanization. Everyone had it bad here, but the most surprising of all was the work of one young girl, a real, genuine heroine of labor, though not suitable for the newspaper. Her place, her duty, in the shop had no name, but one could have called it the upper distributor. 
next to the conveyor belt emerging from the press with cut wet bricks, just mixed from clay and very heavy, stood two girls, one of them the lower distributor and the other the server-up. These did not have to bend down but simply pivot, and not in a wide-angle turn either. But the upper distributor, who stood on a pedestal like the queen of the shop, had incessantly to bend down, pick up a wet brick placed at her feet by the server up, and without crushing it, raise it to the level of her waist or even shoulders, and without changing the position of her feet, turn from the waist at a ninety-degree angle, sometimes to the right and sometimes to the left, depending on which receiving car was being loaded, and distribute the bricks on five wooden shelves, twelve on each. Her motion had no intermission, did not stop or change, and she moved at the speed of fast gymnastics for the whole eight-hour shift, unless the press itself broke down. They kept handing and handing her half of all the bricks produced by the plant during a shift. Down below, the girl switched duties, but she had no replacement for the entire eight hours. She ought to have grown dizzy from five minutes of such work, from those swings of her head and the bending and twisting of her torso. During the first half of her shift, however, the girl still kept her smile. She couldn't carry on a conversation because of the din of the press. And perhaps she liked being put up there on a pedestal like a beauty queen, where everyone could see her strong, bare legs below her hitched-up skirt and the ballet-like elasticity of her waist. And for this work she got the highest ration in the camp, ten and a half extra ounces of bread, a total for the day of thirty ounces. And for her dinner, besides the common black cabbage soup, three stachanovite portions, three pitiful portions of thin semolina cereal made with water. They gave her so little that she inhaled the full contents of the pottery bowl in one swallow. We work for money and you work for bread. No secret there, a grubby free mechanic who had come to fix the press said to me. One armed Punin from the Altai and I rolled away the loaded cars. These cars were like high towers, unsteady because, thanks to ten shelves with twelve bricks each, their center of gravity was high up. Wobbling and tottering like a bookcase overloaded with books, such a car had to be pulled by an iron handle along straight rails, then led up onto a supporting truck, halted there, and then this truck had to be pulled along another straight line past the drying chambers. Brought to a stop at the one required, the car then had to be taken off the truck and pushed ahead of one in still another direction into the drying chamber. Each chamber was a long, narrow corridor along whose walls stretched ten slots and ten shelf supports. One had to push the car right to the back without letting it get out of line and there release the lever setting all ten shelves with the bricks on the ten supports, and release ten pairs of iron grips, and immediately roll the empty car back out. This whole scheme, it seems, was German, out of the nineteenth century, and the car had a German name. But the German scheme provided not only for rails to support the car, but also for a floor laid beneath the pits to support the trucker. But for us, the floor planks were rotten, broken, and I used to stumble and fall through. In addition, there was probably supposed to be ventilation in all the chambers, but there wasn't any, and while I struggled away at my mistakes in stacking, I often got things crooked, shelves got stuck, refused to set, and wet bricks tumbled down on my head. I gulped in carbon fumes, and they burned my windpipe. Therefore, I was not very sorry to leave the plant when I was again driven out to the clay pit, there were not enough clay diggers. They were being released, too. They sent Boris Gamaroff to the clay pit, too, and so we began to work together. The work norm there was well known. During one shift, one worker was to dig, load up, and deliver to the windlass six cars full of clay, eight cubic yards. For two persons, the norm was sixteen. In dry weather, the two of us together could manage six and a half. But an autumn drizzle began, for one day, two, three, without wind, it kept on getting neither heavier nor stopping. It was not torrential, so no one was going to take the responsibility for halting the outdoor work. It never rains on the canal, 
was a famous Gulag slogan. But in Novi Jerusalem, for some reason, they did not even give us padded jackets. And there in the red clay pit beneath that monotonous drizzle, we wallowed and smeared up our old front-line overcoats, which by the end of the third day had already absorbed a pail of water each. The camp also gave us no footwear, and we were rotting our last front-line boots in the wet clay. The first day we still joked. And don't you find, Boris, that Baron Tusenbach would have envied us a good deal right now? After all, he dreamed of working in a brickyard. Do you remember? To work so hard that when he came home he would throw himself on his bed and instantly fall asleep. He evidently supposed that there would be a dryer for wet clothes, that there would be a cot and a hot meal consisting of two courses. But we rolled away a pair of cars and angrily knocking our spades against the iron sides of the next car... The clay stuck to the shovels. This time I spoke with irritation. Just tell me, if you please, what devil made the sisters restless just sitting at home? No one forced them to go out on Sundays with young people to collect scrap. On Mondays no one required of them a precy of the Holy Scriptures. No one forced them to teach for nothing. No one drove them out into the blocks to put into effect universal education. And after one more load... What empty, empty chatter they all indulged in. To work, to work, to work. We'll go ahead and work the hell with you stopping you. What a happy life it will be. So happy, so happy. And what will it be like? You should have been accompanied by police dogs into that happy life. You'd have learned. Boris was weaker than I. He could hardly wield his spade, which the sticky clay made heavier and heavier and he could hardly throw each shovelful up to the edge of the truck. Nonetheless, on the second day, he tried to keep us up to the heights of Vladimir Soloviev. He had outdistanced me there, too. How much of Soloviev he had already read, and I had not read even one line because of my Bessel functions. He told me whatever he remembered, and I kept trying to remember it, but I really couldn't. I didn't have the head for it at that moment. No... How can one preserve one's life and at the same time arrive at the truth? And why is it necessary to be dropped into the depths of camp in order to understand one's own squalor? He said, Vladimir Solviev taught that one must greet death with gladness. Worse than here, it won't be. Quite true. We loaded as much as we could. Penalty ration? So it would be a penalty ration. The hell with you. We wrote off the day and wound our way to camp, but there was nothing joyful awaiting us there. Three times a day that same black, unsalted infusion of nettle leaves, and once a day a ladle of thin gruel, a third of a litre. And the bread had already been sliced. They give fifteen and a quarter ounces in the morning, and not a crumb more during the day or in the evening. And then we were lined up for roll call out in the rain. And once again we slept on bare bunks in wet clothes, muddied with clay, and we shivered because they weren't heating the barracks. And the next day that fine drizzle kept falling and falling. The clay pit had got drenched and we were stuck in it, but good. No matter how much clay you took on your spade and no matter how much you banged it on the side of the truck, the clay would not drop off. And each time we had to reach over and push the clay off the spade into the car. And then we realized that we had been merely doing extra work. We put aside the spades and began simply to gather up the squelching clay from under our feet and toss it into the car. Borea was coughing. There was still a fragment of German tank shell in his lungs. He was thin and yellow, and his nose, ears, and the bones of his face had grown deathly pointed. I looked at him closely, and I was not sure. Would he make it through a winter in camp? We still tried to divert our minds and conquer our situation with thought. But by then, neither philosophy nor literature was there. Even our hands became heavy, like spades, and hung down. Boris suggested, No, to talk takes much strength. Let's be silent and think to some purpose. For example, compose verses in our heads. I shuddered. He could write verses here and now. The canopy of death hung over him, but the canopy of such a stubborn talent hung over his yellow forehead, too. That winter, Boris Gamorov died in a hospital from exhaustion and tuberculosis. I revere in him a poet who was never even allowed to peep. 
His spiritual image was lofty, and his verses themselves seemed to me very powerful at the time. But I did not memorize even one of them, and I can find them nowhere now, so as to be able at least to make him a gravestone from those little stones. And so we kept silent and scooped up the clay with our hands. The rain kept coming. Yet they not only didn't take us out of the clay pit, but Matronina, brandishing the fiery sword of her gaze, her red head was covered with a dark shawl, pointed out to the brigadier from the edge the different ends of the clay pit, and we understood. They were not going to pull out the brigade at the end of its shift at 2 p.m., but would keep it in the clay pit until it fulfilled its norm. Only then would we get both lunch and dinner. In Moscow, the construction project was halted for lack of bricks. But Matronina departed, and the rain thickened. Light red puddles formed everywhere in the clay, and in our car, too. The tops of our boots turned red, and our coats were covered with red spots. Our hands had grown numb from the cold clay, and by this time we couldn't even throw anything into the car. And then we left this futile occupation, climbed up higher to the grass, sat down there, bent our heads, and pulled the collars of our coats up over the backs of our necks. From the side we looked like two reddish stones in the field. Somewhere young men of our age were studying at the Sorbonne or at Oxford, playing tennis during their ample hours of relaxation, arguing about the problems of the world in student cafes. They were already being published and were exhibiting their paintings. They were twisting and turning to find ways of distorting the insufficiently original world around them in some new way. They railed against the classics for exhausting all the subjects and themes. They railed at their own governments and their own reactionaries, who did not want to comprehend and adopt the advanced experience of the Soviet Union. They recorded interviews through the microphones of radio reporters, listening all the time to their own voices and coquettishly elucidating what they wished to say in their last or their first book. They judged everything in the world with self-assurance, but particularly the prosperity and higher justice of our country. Only at some point in their old age, in the course of compiling encyclopedias, would they notice with astonishment that they could not find any worthy Russian names for our letters, for all the letters of our alphabet. The rain drummed on the back of our heads, and the chill crept up our wet backs. We looked about us. The half-loaded cars had been overturned. Everyone had left. There was no one in the entire clay pit, nor in the entire field beyond the compound. Out in the grey curtain of rain lay the hidden village, and even the roosters had hidden in a dry place. We, too, picked up our spades so that no one would steal them. They were registered in our names, and dragging them behind us like heavy wheelbarrows, we went around Matronina's plant beneath the shed where empty galleries wound all around the Hoffman kilns that fired the bricks. There were drafts here, and it was cold, but it was also dry. We pushed ourselves down into the dust beneath the brick archway and sat there. Not far away from us a big heap of coal was piled. Two Zeks were digging into it, eagerly seeking something there. When they found it, they tried it in their teeth, then put it in their sack. Then they sat themselves down and each ate a similar black-gray lump. What are you eating there, fellows? It's sea clay. The doctor doesn't forbid it. It doesn't do any good, but it doesn't do any harm either. And if you add a kilo of it a day to your rations, it's as if you had really eaten. Go on, look for some. There's a lot of it among the coal. And so it was that right up to nightfall the clay pit did not fulfill its work norm. Matronina gave orders that we should be left out all night, but the electricity went out everywhere, and the work compound had no lights, so they called everyone into the gatehouse. They ordered us to link arms, and with a beefed-up convoy to the barking of the dogs and to curses, they took us to the camp compound. Everything was black. We moved along without seeing where it was wet and where the earth was firm, kneading it all up in succession, losing our footing and jerking one another. And in the camp compound it was dark. Only a hellish glow came from beneath the burners for individual cooking. And in the mess hall two kerosene lamps burned next to the serving window. 
and you could not read the slogan, nor see the double portion of nettle gruel in the bowl, and you sucked it down with your lips by feel. And tomorrow would be the same, and every day, six cars of red clay, three scoops of black gruel. In prison, too, we seemed to have grown weak, but here it went much faster. There was already a ringing in the head, that pleasant weakness in which it is easier to give in than to fight back, kept coming closer. And in the barracks, total darkness. We lay there dressed in everything wet, on everything bare, and it seemed it was warmer not to take anything off, like a poultice. Open eyes looked at the black ceiling, at the black heavens. Good Lord, good Lord, beneath the shells and the bombs I begged you to preserve my life, and now I beg you, please send me death. Chapter 7 The Way of Life and Customs of the Natives To describe the native life in all its outward monotony would seem to be both very easy and very readily attainable. Yet it is very difficult at the same time. As with every different way of life, one has to describe the round of living from one morning until the next, from one winter to the next, from birth, arrival in one's first camp, until death, death and simultaneously describe everything about all the many islands and islets that exist. No one is capable of encompassing all this, of course, and it would merely be a bore to read whole volumes. And the life of the natives consists of work, 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 of starvation, cold, and cunning. This work, for those who are unable to push others out of the way and set themselves up in a soft spot, is that self-same general work which raises socialism up out of the earth, and drives us down into the earth. One cannot enumerate nor cover all the different aspects of this work, nor wrap your tongue about them. To push a wheelbarrow. Oh, the machine of the OSO, two handles and one wheel, so. To carry hand barrows, to unload bricks bare-handed. The skin quickly wears off the fingers. To haul bricks on one's own body by goat in a shoulder barrow to break up stone and coal and quarry and mine, to dig clay and sand, to hack out eight cubic yards of gold-bearing ore with a pick and haul them to the screening apparatus. Yes, and just to dig in the earth, just to chew up earth, flinty soil, and in winter, to cut coal underground. And there are ores there, too, lead and copper. Yes, and one can also pulverize copper ore, a sweet taste in the mouth, and one waters at the nose. One can impregnate ties with creosote, and one's whole body at the same time, too. One can carve out tunnels for railroads and build roadbeds. One can dig peat in the bog up to one's waist in the mud. One can smelt ores. One can cast metal. One can cut hay on hummocks in swampy meadows, sinking up to one's ankles in water. One can be a stable man or a dray man. Yes, and steal oats from the horse's bag for one's own pot. But the horse's government issued the old grass bag, and she'll last it out, most likely, but you can drop dead. Yes, and generally the selkhozi, the agricultural camps, you can do every kind of peasant work, and there is no work better than that. You'll grab something from the ground for yourself. But the father of all is our Russian forest with its genuinely golden tree trunks. Gold is mined from them. And the oldest of all the kinds of work in the archipelago is logging. It summons everyone to itself and has room for everyone. And it is not even out of bounds for cripples. They will send out a three-man gang of armless men to stamp down the foot and a half snow. Snow comes up to your chest. You are a lumberjack. First you yourself stamp it down next to the tree trunk. You cut down the tree. Then, hardly able to make your way through the snow, you cut off all the branches, and you have to feel them out in the snow and get to them with your axe. Still dragging your way through the same loose snow, you have to carry off all the branches and make piles of them and burn them. They smoke. They don't burn. And now you have to saw up the wood to size and stack it. And the work norm for you and your brother for the day 
is six and a half cubic yards each, or thirteen cubic yards for two men working together. In Borepolon, the norm was nine cubic yards, but the thick pieces also had to be split into blocks. By then, your arms would not be capable of lifting an axe, nor your feet of moving. During the war years, on war rations, the camp inmates called three weeks at logging dry execution. You come to hate this forest, this beauty of the earth, whose praises have been sung in verse and prose. You come to walk beneath the arches of pine and birch with a shudder of revulsion. For decades in the future, you only have to shut your eyes to see those same fir and aspen trunks, which you have hauled on your back to the freight car, sinking into the snow and falling down and hanging on to them tight, afraid to let go lest you prove unable to lift them out of the snowy mash. Work at hard labor in Tsarist Russia was limited for decades by the normative statutes of 1869. Which were actually issued for free persons, in assigning work, the physical strength of the worker and the degree to which he was accustomed to it, were taken into consideration. Can one nowadays really believe this? The workday was set at seven hours in winter, and at twelve and a half hours in summer. At the ferocious Akatui hard labor center, Yakubovich in the 1890s, the work norms were easily fulfilled by everyone except him. The summer work day there amounted to eight hours, including walking to and from work, and from October on it was seven hours, and in winter only six. And this was even before any struggle for the universal eight-hour work day. As for Dostoevsky's hard labor in Omsk, it is clear that in general they simply loafed about, as any reader can establish. The work there was agreeable and went with a swing. And the prison administration there even dressed them up in white linen jackets and trousers. Now, how much further could they have gone? In our camps, they used to say, "You could even put on a white collar," which meant things were very, very easy, and there was absolutely nothing to do. And they had even white jackets. After work, the hard labor convicts of the House of the Dead used to spend a long time strolling around the prison courtyard. That means that they were not totally fagged out. Indeed, the Tsarist censor did not want to pass the manuscript of the House of the Dead, for fear that the easiness of the life depicted by Dostoevsky would fail to deter people from crime. And so Dostoevsky added new pages for the censor, which demonstrated that life in hard labor was nonetheless hard. In our camps, only the trustees went strolling round on Sundays. Yes, and even they hesitated to. And Shalomov remarks with respect to the notes of Maria Volkonskaya that the Decemberist prisoners in Nerchinsk had a norm of 118 pounds of ore to mine and load each day. 118 pounds? One could lift that all at once. Whereas Shalomov on the Kolyma had a work norm per day of 28,800 pounds. And Shalomov writes that in addition, their summer workday was sometimes sixteen hours long. I don't know how it was with sixteen, but for many it was thirteen hours long on earth-moving work in Karlag, and at the northern logging operations. And these were hours on the job itself, over and above the three miles walk to the forest and three back. And anyway, why should we argue about the length of the day? After all, the work norm was senior in rank. To the length of the workday, and when the brigade didn't fulfil the norm, the only thing that was changed at the end of the shift was the convoy, and the work sloggers were left in the woods by the light of searchlights until midnight, so that they got back to the camp just before morning in time to eat their dinner along with their breakfast, and go out into the woods again. Those who increase work norms in industry can still deceive themselves. Into thinking that such are the successes of the technology of production, but those who increase the norms of physical labor are executioners par excellence. They cannot seriously believe that under socialism the human being is twice as big and twice as muscular. They are the ones who should be tried. They are the ones who should be sent out to fulfill those work norms. There is no one to tell about it either. They all died. And then here's another way they raised the norms and proved it was possible to fulfil them. In cold, lower than sixty degrees below zero, 
work days were written off. In other words, on such days the records showed that the workers had not gone out to work, but they chased them out anyway, and whatever they squeezed out of them on those days was added to the other days, thereby raising the percentages. And the servile medical section wrote off those who froze to death on such cold days on some other basis. And the ones who were left who could no longer walk and were straining every sinew to crawl along on all fours on the way back to camp, the convoy simply shot so that they wouldn't escape before they could come back to get them. And how did they feed them in return? They poured water into a pot, and the best one might expect was that they would drop unscrubbed small potatoes into it, but otherwise black cabbage, beet tops, all kinds of trash. Or else vetch or bran. They didn't begrudge these. And wherever there was a water shortage, as there was at the Samarkar camp near Karaganda, only one bowl of gruel was cooked today, and they also gave out a ration of two cups of turbid, salty water. Everything any good was always, and without fail, stolen for the chiefs, see chapter 9, for the trustees and for the thieves. The cooks were all terrorized, and it was only by submissiveness that they kept their jobs. Certain amounts of fat and meat sub-products, in other words, not real food, were signed out from the warehouses, as were fish, peas, and cereals. But not much of that ever found its way into the mouth of the pot. And in remote places, the chiefs even took all the salt for themselves for their own pickling. In 1940, on the kotlas Vorkuta Railroad, both the bread and the gruel were unsalted. The worse the food, the more of it they gave the zeks. They used to give them horse meat from exhausted horses driven to death at work. And even though it was quite impossible to chew it, it was a feast. Ivan Dobriak recalls today, In my own time I have pushed no small amount of dolphin meat into my mouth, also walrus, seal, sea bear, and all kinds of other sea animal trash. I interrupt. We ate whale meat in Moscow at the Kaluga Gates. I was not even afraid of animal feces, and as for willow herbs, lichens, wild chamomile... They were the very best of dishes. This means he himself went out and added to his rations. It was impossible to try to keep nourished on gulag norms anyone who worked out in the bitter cold for thirteen or even ten hours, and it was completely impossible once the basic ration had been plundered. And this was where Frenkel's satanic mixing paddle was put into the boiling pot. Some sloggers would be fed at the expense of others. The pots were divvied up. If less than 30% of the norm, and in each different camp this was calculated in a different way, was fulfilled, the ration issued you was a punishment block ration, ten and a half ounces of bread and a bowl of gruel a day. For from 30 to 80% of norm, they issued a penalty ration of 14 ounces of bread a day and two bowls of gruel. For from 81 to 100%, you got a work ration of from seventeen and a half to twenty-one ounces of bread and three bowls of gruel. And after that came the shark workers' pots, and they differed among themselves, running from twenty-four and a half to thirty-one and a half ounces of bread a day, and supplementary kasha portions, two portions, and the bonus dish, which was some kind of dark, bitterish, rye dough fingers stuffed with peas. And for all this watery food, which could not possibly cover what the body expended, the muscles burned up at body-rending toil. The shock workers and stakhanovites went into the ground sooner than did the malingerers. This was something the old camp veterans understood very well, and it was covered by their own saying, Better not to give me an extra kasha, and not to wake me up for work. If such a happy stroke of fortune befalls you, as to be allowed to stay on your bunk for lack of clothing, you'll get the guaranteed 21 ounces. If they have dressed you up for the season, and this is a famous gulag expression, and taken you out to work on the canal, even if you wear your sledgehammer down to a chisel, you'll never get more than ten and a half ounces out of the frozen soil. But the Zek was not at liberty to stay on his bunk. Of course, they did not feed the Zek so badly everywhere and always, but these are typical figures for Kraslag in wartime. At Vorkuta, in that same period, the miners' ration was in all likelihood the highest in all of Gulag, 
because heroic Moscow was being heated with that coal. It was 45 and a half ounces for 80 percent of norm underground or 100 percent on the surface. And in that most horribly murderous czarist hard labor Akatui on a non-working day spent on the bunk. They used to give out two and a half Russian pounds of bread, 35 ounces, as well as 32 zolotniks, in other words, 4.65 ounces of meat. And on a working day, there they gave out three Russian pounds, 43 ounces of bread, and 48 zolotniks, seven ounces of meat. Was that not maybe higher than the front-line ration in the Red Army? And the Akatui prisoners carted off their gruel and their kasha by the tub full to the jailer's pigs. And P. Yakubovich found their thin porridge made from buckwheat kasha, Gulag never even saw that, inexpressibly repulsive to the taste. Danger of death from malnutrition is something else that never hung over the hard labor convicts of Dostoevsky's book. And what can you say if geese went wandering around in their prison yard in the camp compound and the prisoners didn't wring their necks? On the basis of the standards of many harsh camps, Shalomov justly reproached me. And what kind of a hospital cat was it that was walking around where you were? Why hadn't they killed it and eaten it long before? The bread at Tsarist Akatui was set out on their tables unrestricted and at Christmas they were given a pound of beef and unlimited butter for their cereal. On Sakhalin, the Tsarist prisoners working on roads and in mines during the months of the most work received each day 56 ounces of bread, 14 ounces of meat, 8 and 3 quarter ounces of cereal. And the conscientious Chekhov investigated whether these norms were really enough or whether, in view of the inferior quality of the baking and cooking, they fell short. And if he had looked into the bowl of our Soviet slogger, he would have given up the ghost right then and there. What imagination at the beginning of our century could have pictured that after thirty or forty years, not just on Sakhalin alone, but throughout the entire archipelago, prisoners would be glad to get even more soggy, dirty, slack-baked bread, with admixtures of the devil only knew what, and the twenty-four and a half ounces of it would be an enviable shock-worker ration. No, even more, that throughout all Russia the collective farmers would even envy that prisoner's ration. We don't get even that, after all. Even at the Tsar's Nerchinsk mines they gave a supplementary gold prospectors payment for everything over the government norm, which was always moderate. In our camps, for most of the years of the archipelago, they either paid nothing for labor or just as much as was required for soap and tooth powder. Only in those rare camps and in those short periods when for some reason they introduced cost accounting and only from one-eighth to one-fourth of the genuine wage was credited to the prisoner could the Zex buy bread, meat and sugar. And all of a sudden, oh, astonishment, a crust would be left on the mess hall table and it might be there for all of five minutes without anyone reaching out a hand to grab it. And how were our natives dressed and shod? All archipelagos are like all archipelagos. The, the blue ocean rolls about them, coconut palms grow on them, and the administration of the islands does not assume the expense of clothing the natives. They go about barefoot and almost naked. But as for our cursed archipelago, it would have been quite impossible to picture it beneath the hot sun. It was eternally covered with snow, and the blizzards eternally raged over it. And, in addition to everything else, it was necessary to clothe and to shoe all that horde of ten to fifteen million prisoners. According to the estimates of the Encyclopedia Rossiya SSSR, there were up to fifteen million prisoners at a time. This figure agrees with the estimate made by prisoners inside the USSR, as we ourselves have added it up. Whenever they publish more proven figures, we will accept them. Fortunately, born outside the bounds of the archipelago, the sex arrived here not altogether naked. This book is continued at this point, on the other side of this cassette.